presenting today is called GMOs, Modern Agriculture, and the People. And I um, say the people because I generally, these days, don't like to commodify people into voters or consumers. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that my Twitter handle is up there in the beginning because I'm very active on Twitter and my DMs are open. I only ask that you don't be weird. <laughs> so the objectives today, um, while I'll talk about the role that GMO has in a sustainable food future, my overarching objective here is to frame GMO as a case study in how perception about technology and how entities that control that tech interface with what I call the people. Um, again, because I don't like to unnecessarily commodify humans. Uh, although, of course, we have to look at them in these ways sometimes. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about me and what brought me to a pro-GMO stance. And could, in case you couldn't tell, uh, I have been very in favor of GMOs in recent times. So who am I? I'm an independent journalist, writer, blogger, and I cover food, health, and parenting from an evidence-based standpoint, although I'm not afraid to let my opinion be known as well. My work appears in a wide number of US-based publications, including Slate Magazine, Forbes, Self Magazine, Undark Magazine, Eating Well, and I'm also the co-founder this is a shout out, by the way, of SciMoms.com, and that's a blog that focuses on evidence-based parenting. That is S-C-I-M-O-M-S.com. My work also appears in Skeptical Inquirer, mostly online with my Woo Watch column. And for the past year, I've also been the co-host of Point of Inquiry, which is the Center for Inquiry's flagship podcast. Um, and I also really quickly have to um, mention there is an episode of Point of Inquiry, if you, um, if you subscribe to it or just look at it on your favorite podcast app, about risk perception with a scientist by the name of Dr. Allison Bernstein, as well as Ida. So of late, I've covered everything from infant chiropractic to childhood food allergies postpartum psychiatric disorders, to uh, human genomic databases, and that's just a few. I have a particular interest of late in the widespread overstatement of the benefits of breastfeeding, um, and while I can't get into that right now, if anyone's going to be around later or wishes to DM me, I can, I can tell you how that's relevant to the GMO discussion. So, um, the picture on the far left is me, and then next to me is Dr. Carl Harovan Mogol, and he's holding up the photo bombing Frank N. Food, your friendly neighborhood genetically modified organism. And then David Sutherland, he is an activist all around, including um, for some time a pro GMO activist. We actually founded a organization called March Against Myths, and we counter-protested for a few years all around the world, um, mostly the US, but um, in Europe as well, against uh, an organization called March Against Monsanto. And some of the footage from that showed up in a movie called Food Evolution. But first, what got me um, into this was essentially fear. So um, I've written about OCD a few times. But um, I didn't really know that I had OCD until after my daughter was born and went through it for a couple months before I realized something was wrong. So I was spending so much time doing rituals to try to prevent this irrational thought of, in my mind of harm coming to my child. Um, so it's the normal fear inherent in parenting that was dialed up to a pathological level. And my risk perception, so relevant, was totally out of whack, so I was afraid of everything, um, SIDS, I was afraid of ruining my breastfeeding relationship, um, I was worried that my child wouldn't be attached to me and we wouldn't have a good relationship and it would ruin their life, <laughs> because I was reading all of this information from 
from sources that are very common in parenting circles. So something had to give, basically. At the same time, there was this pressure that was dialing up to mom hard. How hard can you mom? Are you mom enough? And of course, images like this were a dime a dozen. Fortunately, I found the skeptics movement um, probably halfway through 2011. And it, it pretty much saved me from going irretrievably down the wrong rabbit hole. Um, and I should say that the first skeptic blog I read um, and really got into was The Skeptical OB by Dr. Amy Tudor, but I then uh, found a lot of other skeptical content. I spent my free time over the next couple of years reading scientific literature and observing how the media, bloggers, industry, scientific organizations, celebrities, and my peers talked about food, health, and the environment and how that intersects with parenting. Frankly, I was upset um, that, in my mind at least, um, and in some ways in reality, um, moms everywhere and parents everywhere are being duped into worrying about the things that they shouldn't necessarily be worrying about. So ultimately what I did was arm myself with the tools to evaluate any basic claim as a consumer, as a parent, um, as just me, who I am. And then in 2013, I began blogging at a site called Grounded Parents, which was a then new skeptical parenting site. Around the same time, uh, GMO was really in the zeitgeist. I could sense it at the time, and now Google Trend confirms, or seems to con confirm, the, the sharper rise in popularity of the search term GMO. And I found that in every area of interest that I studied, health, food, medicine, everywhere, um, relevant to the parenting world, GMO kept popping up as an issue that, that intersected, that people were afraid of. And uh, I also learned that to the people, in large part, GMO is not just about genetic engineering. And there are some historical reasons that I, I don't think I'll have time to get to, but potentially during the Q&A. And of course, I'm from America. So I have to bring up this non-GMO project. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this, but it's a label that looks just like that one with the orange butterfly. Um, and the non-GMO project verified label is the fastest growing label in the North American natural products industry, representing, I, I know this is surprising, uh, 26 billion in annual sales. And I mean, you, you can't avoid it. You go to any supermarket, any place that you're normally going to get food, um, uh, whether it's packaged or even fresh produce, will have this label, including plenty of items like grapes and carrots that don't exist in genetically engineered forms. So you can see how powerful this idea of GMO is. Turns out that GMO is more or less a social construct. So what does it actually mean scientifically, politically, socially? It doesn't quite mean this, although a lot of people think that we're you know, taking a gene from a fish and putting it into a squash or something and turning it into a Franken food. Um, that's that's kind of silly, but the common concerns about GMOs I don't think are um, all that silly, although there are some silly ones. I won't get to those, mostly because it feels like punching down, um, even though maybe it's not. But um, none of these concerns, if you would believe it, apply just to genetically engineered crops. So there are concerns about transformation of life forms into intellectual property. And I can understand if someone has that value, but there are plenty, actually, almost all of the crops that are grown, um, even organic, are, are patented. Um, there's this fear of corporate control of the food system. 
Um, but I don't think that GMOs are to blame for that. There's a worry about big ag, monoculture, all of these other things, health disparities. The spectrum of, uh, specter of autism comes up very regularly, especially when it comes to pesticides, but more on that later. There's also this um, concern that Ida mentioned about just the violation of the natural order of things. So essentially, uh, I, I quickly learned that every food system anxiety, whether or not it's fair, is um, uh, scapegoated onto GMO. I've argued that agricultural biotechnology is overregulated because of this view, which is too bad as these technologies offer so many potential solutions, not just environmental solutions, that have been more or less shelved due to restrictions and bans. Um, when it comes to agriculture, I would call GMO the, the villain kind of personified or turned into something manifest that people can um, oppose, right? And um, pesticides are the partner villains. So when it comes to green skepticism, oops, yeah, when it comes to green skepticism in conjunction with nuclear energy and other issues, agriculture should be a key focus area. It seems to be totally irrational to oppose genetic engineering technology as the data show it to be uh, as safe as any other crop modification technology like traditional selective breeding. But of course we know that people aren't making decisions based on data and facts. This doesn't necessarily mean that all GMOs are good. That is often a value judgment to be made on a case-to-case -case basis. But um, the fact is that genetic engineering as a method is as safe as at any other breeding technique. And I'll get to some of those in a moment. But uh, as we see here, Agriculture contributes the bulk of non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions and about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this, this report is available on the, on the URL there. So it's important to examine what agricultural genetic engineering can really do, but also to examine why people became so opposed to it so as not to repeat these mistakes. But first, uh, I'll provide some specific on agricultural genetic engineering itself. So it's a, a breeding technique is what genetic engineering is, essentially. Um, and a few examples of traits that have been introduced via genetic engineering to give you a visual. Um, this, of course, isn't all of them. But we have rainbow papaya, that's um, the letter, the A and B there. It was genetically engineered to add a bit of a viral genome acting as a vaccine um, against papaya ring spot virus, which th threatened to wipe out the papaya industry in Hawaii. We have uh, a citrus greening uh, resistant citrus. Trees with a spinach gene show resistance to um, this greening disease. Um, and then we also have, uh, not pictured here, tear-free onions, hypoallergenic peanuts, gluten-free wheat. Um, and then you'll see there the Arctic apple, but I will explain more about that um, uh, in more detail. So now we get to crop modification techniques. This is an infographic from Biology Fortified, which I highly recommend. There's a blog and um, other great projects there, including infographics. So you look at all of these crop modification techniques, including polyploidy, which is the multiplication of the number of chromosomes in a crop to impact its fertility. Um, and then we have our crossbreeding, which many people are familiar with. But out of all of this, um, only transgenesis and uh, genome editing, it, it's, it's kind of up in the air. Um, only transgenesis is considered GMO. But, I mean, all of these are, are very much genetically altering the organism. Mm -hmm. 
One thing that's surprising to a lot of people is the list of uh, currently available genetically engineered products. Um, it's only 10 or 12. It used to be eight not too long ago. So now we have 12 and you see um, some of the traits that they were engineered for and the, um, the uses of these. And you see that um, a lot of them are for few food, excuse me, for humans. And then of course we have textiles, but also livestock feed. So now let's talk about the potential for GMO to um, play a role in sustainable ag. This is just a couple examples. We have the fast growing Aqua Advantage salmon made by a company called Aqua Bounty Technologies. So you say that you give a person a fish and they'll eat for a day and you um, teach them to fish and they'll eat for a lifetime but if you learn to harness the power of genetics to more efficiently grow aquatic creatures, we level up to producing more sustainable food. And it's, it doesn't always necessarily take genetic engineering. It's something that we've been doing um, to some extent over the past few decades. Uh, for example, do we have oyster fans in the audience? Anyone? One? <laughs> One oyster fan. Um, yeah, it's a, I guess it's an individual preference, right? Um, I didn't used to like them, but now I sort of do. But um, the oysters that you get in oyster bars, the, the plump, juicy ones at restaurants, um, these are actually triploid. So they were created, um, there, there was one method back in the 60s and then another method devised um, about a decade later by the same scientist that um, changes the number of its chromosomes. So normally it's diploid, it has two sets. This one has three sets, so it cannot produce the uh, pesky gonads. It turns out oysters are actually known as the ballsiest creatures on Earth because their gonads take up about 40% of their, of their body mass. But, um, yeah, I learned that because I just wrote a script about, <laughs> about a aquatic um, a breeding of aquatic creatures. So Aqua Advantage salmon's makers developed the salmon by uh, inserting the growth hormone gene from the Chinook salmon and a short bit of DNA called a promoter from a fish called the ocean pout into the fertilized eggs of wild type Atlantic salmon. So all genes in all organisms have promoters which act like on and off switches for genes. So the creators chose to use the ocean pout promoter because it was previously shown to act on the ocean pout's growth hormone receptor, or sorry, growth hormone gene year round, allowing it to grow um, all 12 months of the year, as opposed to the wild Atlantic salmon, uh, which uh, it, the promoter is affected by environmental factors like temperature and daylight length. The Chinook salmon's growth hormone gene was chosen because the Chinook tends to convert feed more efficiently into biomass than the Atlantic salmon. So the resulting Aqua Advantage fish, which was approved to be grown and sold in the US um, just in 2019, and there is now a facility in the state of Indiana, uh, grows faster with 25% less feed to produce the same biomass as wild counterparts, um, making it potentially an important high, qu uh, high quality protein source that doesn't put pressure on declining wild fish populations. Of course, that de uh, depends on the demand, and that is yet to be seen. So we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, and the next example is Arctic apples. <laughs> One problem that we've had is that people can't touch biotechnology, so Arctic apples change all that. When an apple is... Um, bitten into or sliced, it undergrows enzymatic browning, which is the fruit's intrinsic um, chemical reaction to cell injury. This leads to food waste uh, through all parts of the supply chain, from the orchard to the consumer's mouth. It's not just a cosmetic issue. Um, bruising also allows pathogens to enter the fruit. Uh, interesting 
uh, thing about this technology is that can be a applied to any apple variety, unlike another apple that calls itself non-browning, but it's not. It's, it's slow browning, that's the opal apple, and it's also non-GMO project verified. So overall, uh, GE Tech has led to net benefits to the environment. So you um, see here that uh, the total environment, uh, environmental impact, of course, is very reductionist. Depends on how you slice the data and what metrics you look at. But this figure is from a 2016 study on genetically engineered crops and pesticide use in the US um, maize and soybeans. EIQ stands for Environmental Impact Quotient, which was a, a measure devised uh, that accounts for toxicity rather than just um, amounts in weight. So that last one um, was, was promising for insect-resistant insect traits. The same study um, didn't reveal as clear a picture when it comes to herbicide-resistant crops, um, but you know, it's not as obvious of a benefit for now. So we see the role uh, that genetic engineering can play, but um, GMO does not, again, equal uh, just genetic engineering to people. It's all of these other concerns. Uh, and I, I, I think this chart kind of uh, captures it well. It is uh, not about GMO. It's about the clean label, which is uh, picking up some um, momentum in the US. And the Clean Label Project itself, which is a third party certifier, has some data on what people uh, really think when they're thinking about clean. So um, of course at the top they say no to artificial flavors, chemicals, et cetera. But underneath all of that you have this craving for authenticity, the, the distrust of big food, the, the need to be heard and empowered, and a desire to return to nature. So you see how these values are underlying everything. So anti-GMO has a lot of really ridiculous stuff. Uh, and th this is a chart you might be familiar with. Uh, I don't think I'll have a chance to get into it now um, because of time. But I mean, non-GMO project, for example, certifies cat litter as non-GMO. It's just one example. But I mean, it's cat litter. Anyway. <laughs> But uh, when you, looking back at that same Google Trends chart, when you, when you look at what people believe about GMO and agriculture, you can't get away from the M word, Monsanto. Um, and, and there's really no getting around that. So when we consider the question, what does GMO really mean, um, genetic Engineering offers several solutions, um, but it's, you're just not gonna get away from this, even though Arctic apples, for example, and um, Aqua Advantage salmon are not Monsanto products, but I should mention that both of those companies were recently acquired by a larger company called Intrexon, so there is something to this idea that small biotech uh, has a tendency to be absorbed by bigger biotech. And that is, um, that's a concern that I, I think can be valid. So pro-GMO also has its problem. Um, there's, you see this GMO as panacea narrative, and that's a false narrative. There's a failure to speak to the values, the, the hidden part of the iceberg. There's the use of science as a bludgeon. And there's some intellectual dishonesty about um, several issues that uh, maybe I can talk to you all about later. Also, feel free to Google my name in GMO. I've, I've talked ad nauseum about this. Um, but uh, a recent article of mine, it's an uh, opinion piece about my interactions with Monsanto's PR and some scientists and other uh, people over the years, um, I, I got this distinct feeling, and it's not just me, that Monsanto was trying to spread this idea that if you're pro-science, you must be pro-GMO. And of course, GMO also needs to come in quotes. And if you're um, 
pro-GMO, you must be pro-Monsanto. So if you are um, anti-Monsanto, you are anti-science. Um, and I just don't think this is an argument that, that works. It's something that is not very surprising to me right now um, uh, in the skeptics movement especially. I think we need to consider these. So uh, just, I'm, I, I think I'm down to three minutes left. Uh, am, am I good? Just fine. Okay, I'm good, all right. So a sustainable f food future, there is incredible complexity to achieving this. Um, the World Resources Institute, together with partners including Princeton University, developed a global accounting and biophysical model that quantifies food production, consumption from national diets, and land use demands. And the model also uh, estimates greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, including um, from production all the way up to the farm gate when the product leaves. Um, and uh, also from the energy used to produce fertilizers and pesticides or to run farm machinery. The full, um, oops. The full document from the World Resources Institute is publicly available and it's quite extensive. It's about 30 pages, but um, it's really interesting. So if you're interested in green issues, I highly recommend needing it. So um, using these measures, they identified the need to close three primary gaps, um, and that is in food production, uh, agricultural land use, and greenhouse gas mitigation. So uh, the, the GMO can play a role in a sustainable food future. That um, statement is not from the report. That's just my observation. But um, uh, the World Resource Institute identified three overarching global ob objectives, which um, are boosting productivity, shifting diets to reduce demand for ruminant meat, and reducing food loss and waste. So um, there are many examples, but of course the Arctic apple is one example of something that can reduce food waste. Now, I'm not quite sure how sustainable uh, Arctic apples are in practice. I've actually brought a sample uh, I'll pass around uh, maybe during the panel, and this is Arctic app bits. It's a dried Arctic apple, and it's sold in a package like this. So the thing is we're not sure that um, their kind of marketing plan and their business model is sustainable, although the fruit itself is more sustainable in theory than, uh, than a regular apple. Um, and I should mention that part of their recommendation for shifting diets to reduce demand for ruminant meat is um, uh, improving aquaculture and uh, reducing pressure on wild populations. So, Kind of a, a, a closing idea is that these values, the idea is really important. It might sound, uh, you know, fluffy, but it's, it is true that the deficit model has not been shown to work on its own um, by itself in the real world. There's no consensus that simply filling in the information deficit on the safety of genetic engineering changes m minds on a broad scale. So. Ultimately, uh, the question is, what's the solution to this? So uh, I think the solution has to start with some very basic changes, and that's dropping this polarization between anti and pro, because um, if we really want to solve these problems, we need to take the best of all different um, production systems and methods. So we need to embrace nuance, strive for intellectual honesty. Um, for example, there I've seen people arguing in favor of genetic engineering, this is actually a scientist, say that eliminating organic agriculture will have much more impact than reducing the consumption of uh, red meat. He actually said just banning organic agriculture would have more of an impact, but what he didn't take account is, of course, that agriculture um, isn't mostly organic. It's still a very small uh, total amount is organic. So the goal is solutions, not scoring for our teams, right? 
Um, so I, I really think that we need to keep the humility and skepticism. So that's all I had for you um, until the questions. So thank you for listening.